Thanks, Tracer. So, hi, I'm Andrew. It's awesome that all of y'all are here. Uh, it's good to see y'all. Uh, first things first, I'm going to pass this around if you can just write your name. Uh, it's like a sign in. There's going to be a more official sign in, which we're going to do the very first thing. You're going to have to like get on your laptops or something and type your name in. It's new, so I'm not quite sure how to do it, but it's going to work out really well. Uh, it's for all for y'all's benefit. But welcome to Parker. Welcome to Try One. Are we excited yet? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Are we overwhelmed yet? Do we know like what to print off, what not to print off? Have we figured all that stuff out yet? Have we wasted a lot of printing dollars? A little bit. Killed some trees? Good. Does anybody still have questions about what they would like to print off? Or does anybody want some guidance on that? What are your recommendations for All right, so us tutors, we actually all got together yesterday, two days ago. And uh, we talked about it. So for DAA, what we recommend is printing, uh, having, using his PowerPoints as your main resource. Uh, so actually using the PowerPoints, whether that be on your iPad or printing them off. Um, that's just because he has that on his screen and he just goes slide by slide and that way you're not trying to write down everything that's on the slide. He goes pretty quickly. He's going slow now, but he's going to go a lot faster, especially when we get into muscles. So uh, using the PowerPoints is our best recommendation. You don't need to print them all off at one time. If you want to just print it uh, unit by unit, so starting off with phones and then muscles and what have you. Uh, that way you don't have to carry around this whole big stack and you can just keep, keep that together a little bit easier. So that's what we do for DAA. For biochem, the best thing that I can tell you all to do is to find a copy of this book. On Dr. Sarkar's syllabus is the way to order it. I think it's through Linus Books. It's going to take at least a week to ship, maybe a week and a half. Um, but. Uh, that's the best thing to do online on Dr. Sarkar's uh, class page. It has all of his notes on all of his PowerPoints, but a lot of those PowerPoints don't have all of the pictures on them. Uh, and I'm sure some people have told you that or you found that out halfway through all your printing and you're like, mm, these are a lot of blank pages. Uh, so if there's any way you can get your hands on one of these books, whether it's, um, I got mine, just I asked in upper trials, like I was in the library studying and he's like, hey, do you need a book? And I said, yes. And he just let me borrow it. Uh, and you'll find out that a lot of people are just nice enough to potentially loan it to you or even rent it to you or if you want to buy it from another try. There's the Parker Classifieds page, uh, Parker University Student Classifieds, something like that on Facebook. Mm -hmm. If you want to try to go through there and find something uh, or you can pay the $80.54 that I did for my book also. I, bought, I had to buy another one to teach y'all. Um, sales and Tissues. Uh, Deanna just uh, told me what she does for that. I'm not, I'm not really a sales and tissues person, biochem tutoring. So uh, I, don't, I think that one's a little bit more straightforward, just have her notes. Uh, she usually goes, I think on her um, like word notes, like just her written ones, she goes pretty by those, by the book with those. So if you want to use that and then write in things on the side, that'll be really good. That's what I did, and it worked out for me. Hi. I'm happy. Ah, that's okay. All right. Are there any other questions that we want to get out of the way? What about the other classes, like trying one off DXI? Um, DXI, Tracer, do you want to? You just got out of that. Do you want to tell them what you did? Uh, I use my computer to see notes online. So, uh, and SMC is what you said? Uh, SMC, I just use PowerPoint to my computer. He goes pretty bad. Yeah, I think for both of those classes, PowerPoint's going to be the easiest. Um, for Dr. Russell, a lot of his teaching, I think, is the Socratic. He kind of just like wants y'all to talk and get involved yourselves, uh, which is really helpful. But if there is a textbook that you don't want to buy or you want to rent, um, one, you can go into the stacks in the library. And you can check out a book, whether I think they, they keep old versions of books in there. So if you want to check out a book, you can do that for two weeks at a time. 
like no one does that. So really, like you can pretty much just keep rechecking that out the whole year if you wanted to. Or if you want, uh, behind the help desk, uh, they have copies of every single required textbook for every single class. So if you want to check out like Senate's book for reading FOC, or if you want to check out the Developing Human for um, Embryo for Dr. S, uh, you can do that. It just the rule is you can't take it out of the library. So you just check it out. You give them your ID. You can go sit on the couch or go to the, one of the rooms and read whatever chapter you need to and just take it right back. So we have those resources there too. If if you want to just do that for free. They have mouse in there too. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. They have they have this book. Or, yeah. Cool. Yeah, and they have this book too. So if you want, just try not to like mark all over it because it's kind of for everybody. But if you want to just take your own notes to the side. But that's what I did try one a lot. I just tried to do all my studying here on campus because I knew when I got home, I'm just going to turn the TV on and watch football and do nothing. But clinical reasoning, show up. Yeah. Really, that's just, that's just an introduction to say, hey, like, you're going to be a doctor. This is kind of how you need to start learning to think and process um, different challenges, scenarios for you. So really to show up for that. That one's all, from what I remember, just in-class projects and yeah. Any other questions? Cool. All right. Well, welcome to Biochem. Uh, like I said in class earlier, um, we're here to help you. Uh, I know Tracer, he's, he's wonderful. We have, I think, at least six or seven other tutors um, that are here to help you out with either biochemistry or anatomy or uh, cells and tissues. I struggled mightily with cells and tissues and I wish like we had this structure now where I could just go to someone, you know, on Wednesday or on Thursday after class and just say, hey, can you just like please tell me what the heck I'm looking at under this microscope. Uh, but there's, there's a lot of resources. If you want to figure out what works best for your schedule, if you go into the teacher's offices in the East Building, if you all know, we're in the North Building, there's a South one, there's Parker West if you want to go get a beer too. Um, ha, 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 ha. I'm, I'm going to tell a lot of really bad jokes, so just I'll take anything really if, if we're being honest. Um, but they're in the East Building up, upstairs and there should be, yeah, the Wild Turkey, yeah. <laughs> there it is, light bulb. It, it was a thinker, right? It was a thinker. So there, there should be a whiteboard with all of our schedules on it. That should be completed by the end of this week. And just if you want to plug that in to wherever you're free, whether it's during lunch, then we might have some before school, after school, what have you. Whatever works best for you, that's what we're here for. We're here for your success. And we're just students like you who've gone through everything. So in theory, we kind of have an understanding of what's going on and what you're going through. But here's Biochem. So excited that y'all are all here at the beginning. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times, this is a class that people put off kind of uh, right because you're studying for anatomy. It's so intensive, right? I don't know if any, who here has, who here has taken anatomy before? Or who has not taken anatomy? We got some, that's good. The first time I ever took anatomy, I got a 38 raw score on my first test. And then it, it curved up to a 50, so that was exciting. Um, and then my first practical, I got a 50 on it. And then the second test, I got a 70, nine on it. And I ended up dropping the class just because I didn't want like a C on my, or potentially even failing it, you know. Uh, I took on way too much uh, that semester in college and I was taking anatomy, uh, I don't know, not, not, not about me. But anyway, I dropped it. And that was one of like the hardest decisions I've ever made in my life was to drop a class. I thought I was a failure. I thought I didn't know how to handle myself. And uh, I even struggled, like, am I even going to continue doing chiropractic? I was taking organic chemistry at the time, and I was not doing well at that either. So I was like, do I even want to be a chiropractor? I can just go to PT school, and I'll just do PT, and, like, that'll be okay. I, like, called crying to my grandma. I was like, Grandma, what am I going to do with my life? Um, but seriously, I did. And uh, but she said just stick it out, and even if you have to drop it, that's fine. But it's all about just doing what's best for you and focusing your attention. So really, that was just a wake-up call for me to say, hey, what am I doing with my life? Like, I want to be a doctor, so I can't be going out, staying up late, going to clubs, going, I didn't, I'm not really a clubber, so I didn't really do that, but staying in, 
drinking, watching SVU, like can't be doing that all the time. Uh, so it's just getting your mind right. And that's what I want to tell you all here first day, if you can, just try to eliminate as much of the distractions as possible. Like stay on campus, stay and study here at the library so you can focus and get what you need to be done here now first. Um, try one's the hardest just because there is so much that's new and it's not undergrad anymore. For those of you that are coming straight out of undergrad, um, it's, it's easy to fall back into the undergrad mentality of, all right, I'll study for a little bit and then I'll go do whatever I'm doing or I won't study and I'll just show up and take a test and everything will be perfect and just it's going to be just the same. It's not. Um, this is doctor school. I'm not trying to be like mean or be rude, but just to let you know, like only less than 1% of the population in the United States is able to put the words doctor in front of their name. So we have to outwork 99% of the other people in this country to earn it. So that's, just how, that's what's great that y'all are here is that y'all are starting out early to do that. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. But anyway, biochemistry. Who here has taken chemistry, regular chemistry, recently? Um, who here has taken biology recently? Who here has taken, actually taken biochemistry? Some of y'all, good. Who here has not taken any biochemistry, or who hasn't taken a biochemistry class ever? Yeah, I didn't either. I had never taken biochemistry here until I got here. So you can do it. You can, you can learn it. It'll be fine. Um, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. It's actually, I'm going to try to make it fun, as fun as possible. Dr. Sarkar is wonderful. Yes, he has an accent. Yes, he, like, I'm just going to say it up front, you know, like, he's not from America, okay? <laughs> but, um, yes. But don't let that be an excuse. He is a great person. He is a great teacher. He knows this, he wrote this book, so he knows, it in, he knows this information inside and out. Um, it's on you to just sit there and pay attention. Yeah, it might, you might need to use a little bit more attention, a little bit more focus because of it, but don't let an accent be an excuse because we all can understand him. We all can have conversations with him, so don't let that be a barrier to your learning. Um, just want to say that up front. So if you come up to me, we had, we had a, what is it, like a sensitivity training or a diversity training last trimester, and that was one of the things that I constantly heard, and I even used the excuse myself, is, oh, I don't have, I have a teacher from a different country, so that makes it difficult for me. Yeah, it makes it difficult, but that's not an excuse for you to put an effort to do well. So if y'all come to me with that excuse, I'm not going to cut it. So just letting you know now. All right, biochemistry, it's fun, I promise you. And it tells you everything you need to know is in the words. I'm going to be constantly trying to explain and show to you that the, just like a medical definition, right? For those of you who have had a medical terminology class, like all the Greek word actually translates to something that's um, very like easy to understand. When you're taking DAA, like you'll learn that clivus means slope and what have you like that. So when you're looking at that bone, you're like, oh, there's a big slope thing, so duh. Um, biochemistry, chemistry is the exact same. All the chemists are doing is saying, uh, here's, this thing and it looks like this or it describes this and therefore it's named this. And the earlier you can kind of pick up on that and try to understand the, the language when you're reading a test, you're not going to be confused by this big word. You're, gonna, you're not going to see phosphoglycerate, whatever, and you're like, oh god, like, whoa, oh my god, I don't, I don't know what that is. But you just break it down, like phospho, it's a phosphate, glycerate. It's just a glycerate, not a big deal. So, whatever. So, chapter one. Who here does not have this book yet? I'm going to guess pretty much everybody. For those of you that do, good job. I'm proud of y'all, actually. Good job. I did not have the book day one. Don't be like me. I guess it's kind of too late for that. Um, uh, so if you can, just try to, try to ask around. If you can find the book, it's just going to make your life the easiest. Bite the bullet. Pay the money if you need to. Review of basic chemistry. How far did, has, did Dr. Sarkar get today? Five. Slide five. <laughs> page six. We got to covalent bonding. Wonderful. Okay. Um, I like starting week one because we don't feel like we're already behind already. If we can just try to stay with him, that's my goal. So we're either going to do one or two chapters every week, 
Um, plan for until 7. Hopefully we can get done before that, just because it's nice to not listen to my voice for this long. I don't even like listening to my voice for this long. But just plan to go into 7. And then if we get done early, we'll throw a party. We'll go across the street to West Campus. I'm from all, I went to the University of Texas, so West Campus was kind of a big deal. <laughs> Whatever. OK. <laughs> Chemistry of life. Um, everything is made up of cells. Um, so pretty much everything deals with biomolecules, whatever. And I'm going to rely heavily on y'all's feedback. Um, when I went to tutoring sessions, I was kind of the person who just wanted the person to talk to me. I was very passive with my learning. So if that's you, I totally get it. But I do want y'all to interact with me, answer my questions if I ask them, uh, or let me know if we need to skip something. But do not be shy, do not be bashful. When my dad cooks, he says if uh, you're bashful getting servings, then you don't deserve to eat my food. Um, so that's gonna be kind of my style with tutoring too, is if you're bashful and you don't uh, feel confident speaking up, you need to get over it and just speak up. If you have a question, say it. If you have a comment, you don't understand something, say it. There's no stupid questions. I thought there was, there's not. Because I've asked enough and there's not. It's all about your understanding. So do we need to go over the different uh, organelles in the cell? Is that really really important? It's not really, really important. But it will be nice for cells and tissues to understand. You're going to go over this in cells and tissues as well. But even if you don't know, I don't, did, he, I don't, did he ask anything on this on, in, the, in the test? I don't think so. So knowing that he's not going to ask anything on this test, probably. Do we want to go over this? No? OK. We're going to go over anyway. No, I'm joking. We're not. I'll listen to y'all. All right, characteristics of life. Life is very complex, right? Guys don't understand girls because they're too complex. We don't really understand the entire brain because it's so complex. Uh, but we're going to try to break it down as much as possible. Uh, I cannot see that at all. And I'm going to try to go through this book as much as possible. So when you do get your book and you're studying, if you want to rewatch this vodcast, this vodcast is going to be saved and recorded and sent to you hopefully tomorrow morning if you do want to rewatch it. Um, all your classes are vodcasted if you didn't know that either. Um, we need to be able to see and respond to environmental changes, right? So if we have sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, right, we need to be able to respond to that. If something's too hot, we need to have our uh, flexors flex away and our opposite extensors extend to balance us, yes. Um, elements, atoms and molecules. We have all of our elements on our periodic table, yes. You aren't required to learn the entire periodic table. Good, right? Yay. They're broken up into uh, electrons, protons, and neutrons, right? We have our typical, um, what is it, element? And so our protons are, this is sound really basic for those of you who've taken chemistry, but I'm just trying to be thorough with everything. Protons are positive, that alliteration. Protons, positive. Neutrons are neutral. Those are both located in the center of the cell. And then we have our electrons uh, that are floating around on the outside in our electron cloud that are negatively charged. And a lot of the interactions within our body a lot of the chemical reactions are really just taking electrons from one element or one molecule and putting them on a different one. And that's really what makes up a lot of interactions. Like cell signaling really is just like electrons moving from one place to another, or um, buffer systems in our body being able to take and accept electrons to prevent large pH changes, trying to take everything on a bigger scale. Um, we have inorganic and organic molecules, not a big deal. Um, atoms and electron shells. This is important. And I'm going to try to mark, I don't know, I liked it when I was able to kind of mark like what's a TQ or know what the big points are. Dr. Sarkar is pretty good about saying this is kind of a big deal. He'll repeat something one or two times. Um, so I usually just like, like to write a little TQ next to that. So when I'm going back to studying, I can say, all right, he emphasized this, so probably know this pretty well. Electron shells. Our electrons are layered around our nucleus with our protons and neutrons inside of it. 
in different shells. Uh, we can see here hydrogen has one shell, whereas carbon has two shells. And that all goes back to um, the rows on the periodic table, right? So hydrogen is in the first row. It has one shell for two electrons. Um, carbon is in the second row, so it's got two shells. Uh, potassium, or I'm sorry, sodium is in the third row, three shells, and further down. Yeah, question? Can we have access to the periodic table on the test? You won't need it. You won't need it, no. Um, yeah, this is like basic. So this is just like a review, trying to catch you up on kind of chemistry in general. Question? Uh, so what, how would this test question for electron shells be? Um, he's going he's gonna to ask you about the valence shells. So he'll say something like, um, what type of electrons are in the outermost shell? And you have to know it's the valence electrons. It's like a definition. Or um, what electrons participate in chemical reactions? And you'll have to know like the outermost shell or the outermost electrons or the valence electrons, something like that. Does that answer your question? I can try that. Just because every teacher works in different yeah. amounts of wording, and so you want to Yeah. That's something that I need to work on, too. I, I try to make mock tests for all y'all for before the test. And his first one is usually the one that trips people up the most. I don't know if maybe you didn't experience that. Um, but I'm working on that. So there will be a mock exam for everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm going to try, like the week before the test, my goal is to try to meet with Dr. Sarkar and hopefully look at the test or even talk to him about like which things did he emphasize the most. Because um, I know this, a lot of this is from my memory of what his test is and talking with other people, what his test was. And uh, so I'm going to go see if I can refresh that memory and, or see if he's changed anything. But he's usually pretty consistent with everything that he does. Um, so electron shells. Uh, depends on the atomic number, kind of what we talked about in the different rows. The first shell can only contain uh, two electrons. Why is that? That's because there's only hydrogen and helium in that top row. There's only two um, different elements, so there can only be two electrons in that first shell. The second shell can contain up to eight electrons. That's because if we count across, there's eight different elements all the way across. So each element gets one additional electron. This is all just kind of like J basic information, probably not going to test on this. Um, he might ask that, but most importantly, he's going to ask, um, electrons in the more distant shells have higher energy. So the more shells that you have, the higher energy the molecule is. Um, and the valence electrons are pretty much just talking about that outermost shell. So here on carbon, we have the valence shell would be this outermost one, and those would be the valence electrons within the shell. And those are what uh, are participating in the, 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 the reactions that are going on because they're the most readily accept like, uh, accessible, right? We're not going to, um, when we're in the grocery store and we're picking out like our cereal or what are we, the good food, right? So we're picking out like the broccoli or like our oranges that are like right there. Um, we pick the ones that are closest to us, right? We, we check those first. We don't like, dig through everything and find the one on the bottom and like pick that up? No. It's the same thing. With uh, chemical reactions, it's the most readily available. That's all the valence is. Chemical bonding, there's for sure going to be some test questions. He's going to give an example. He's like, this, this type of bond is an example of covalent bond or ionic bond. Um, so we have, how many different ones? We have three main big categories of bonds. Uh, electrovalent, which is just ionic. Uh, covalent, and hydrogen. And we'll go on through examples here. So electrovalent ionic bond here at the bottom are valence electrons are transferred from one atom to another. And they form charged atoms, ions. So kind of going over here. With this, we're going to have something that 
uh, is going to be a positive and a negative. This is the whole like opposites attract type thing, right? Or maybe some of y'all heard it as uh, chloride steals an electron from sodium. Like I like to think it's more they're kind of sharing. He's like, oh, like you can have it. I'm a nice person. You're not stealing it. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, I'm funny. All right. So that's ionic bonds. So what happens is uh, sodium uh, isn't happy where it's at on the periodic table. These uh, all these elements on the right side all have entirely full shells, right? These all have all eight on the side or two for helium. So sodium has like eight and then it's got this like one awkward valence. And that's really, he's like, I got this extra, I don't, I don't like it, I don't really want it. Like I kind of like to be back, like just, I get, like to get rid of it and just have kind of eight on the outside and being full, right? Uh, well chloride, is all the way over here, and it's like, I got seven. It's like, I really want eight, because that would make me super happy if I can just have all that whole valence shell full, and I can just go to bed full and like content and just sleep really well. So what happens is um, sodium's like, hey, you know what, chloride, do you want, do you want my extra one? Like, you, you can have it, I don't really want it. And that's like, yes, I want it, thank you. Like, you're such a good person. Uh, <laughs> So that's so pretty much sodium donates that last electron to chloride. So now it's minus an electron. And electrons are positively or negatively charged. Negatively charged, right? So if you remove a negative charge, you're going to be more positive, right? So that's why we have this sodium with a positive sign next to it. So chloride, now it gained that electron. Electrons are negative. We already established that. So if it gained that negative charge, it's going to have that negative charge on it. So that's why we have uh, sodium positive, chloride negative, and that bond is just that positive and negative um, uh, attracted to each other. Very, very weak in our body, right? Mm -hmm. Our body is full of water. Yes, ionic bonds dissolve in water. Yes? So for, for each of those. Mm, let's, use, let's use these pictures, all right? So it has it all right here. Um, I'm going to be fancy. Ooh, OK. All right, so here's sodium here, right? Mm -hmm. And it's got this shell is full. That shell, this, it has two, right? The first shell is two. Second shell is eight, yeah? There's eight in this second shell. And this valence shell, the outside one, only has one electron in it. One is not full, correct? One is not eight. So it's like, hey, I, be, I want this last shell to be full. Would it be easier for me to add seven more electrons here? Or would it be easier for me to dump that one? It'd be easier for me to dump that one, right? Um, so chlorine, chlorine over here, we have full innermost with two, full middle one with eight, this last one, seven. So it's like, would it be easier for me to dump seven, or would it be easier for me to gain one? It'd be easier to gain one, right? So sodium's like, hey, I got one. Chloride's like, hey, I need one. So pretty much this electron just goes over here. And when the sodium loses that electron, it's losing that negative, right? So it's becoming more positive. Um, it's like when you um, eliminate something bad from your life, like say you stop drinking soda, it's like you're removing that negative so your life is more positive overall. So Don't drink soda. So chlorine is, like I, I, I'm getting the, you know, that, the very far right column on the periodic table, mm -hmm. eight electrons, mm -hmm. the one next to it's got seven where chlorine is, mm -hmm. and that, the, that eight and that seven is what is in the outer shell. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, so going back, great observation. So all of these yeah. have one electron. All of these have two electrons in their outer shell. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, three is starting with, I think, a C. 
with boron. Four. Yeah. I thought that's three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Mm -hmm. And then what about all those others? Don't worry about it. Okay. Those are all the like intermediate stuff. Yeah, you gotta like twist the paper and it like lines up. Don't worry about it. Is there a question in the back? No, one other stage two. Cool. This is just like understanding the bond. Um, so I'm probably going more in depth than he did uh, on it. But pretty much the moral of the story is um, sodium, it wants, it's happiest when it doesn't have that extra valence. It can just drop down to this full valence shell. So it gets rid of it by getting rid of the electron, it becomes positive. Chlorine gets it, so it's negative, and the opposite attract. <coughs> a positive charge is attracted to a negative charge. In chemistry, that's what happens. Um, so if two positives are going to repel each other, two negatives are going to repel each other, but a positive and a negative are going to attract each other, coming together, making the bond. Yeah? Can you tell me what the bulk bond is at? No. Not right now. Not right now. Good. Any questions on ionic bonds? Any other questions? Cool. If you have them, ask them. If not, we're just going to keep going. Covalent bond. So this is when atoms share valence electrons, right? Valence electrons are the ones on the innermost or outermost part of the shell. Outer, right? Good. There are two different types of covalent bonding, and this trips up some people sometimes. That was really helpful, wasn't it? Um, so we have nonpolar covalent bonds, and we have polar covalent bonds. Uh, I'm going to start with nonpolar. What does non mean? Not, polar. not, right? Yeah, it means not polar. Uh, so let's, what polar means is that, hmm, polar means that uh, they're, hmm, let's start with polar. I lied. We're going we're gonna to start with polar. Yeah, so polar, polar covalent bonds, they share them unequally, okay? So, uh, Water, we're going to use water, right? H2O, yes? We have two hydrogens, one oxygen. How this works, if you've taken a chemistry class, you've probably seen this before, but if you haven't taken a chemistry class, that's fine too. Um, our two hydrogens are positive, right? Well, our hydrogens are positive, and then our oxygens are typically negative. Uh, they have a negative, uh, kind of like a subcharge. They're not entirely negative but they're more negative uh, than they are positive in relation to hydrogens. So here I kind of drew a really bad drawing looking back on it now. Uh, so we have uh, the way the water, it's in a bent formation, doesn't matter. But the two hydrogens are kind of down on this side. And there's an overall, like kind of like a baby positive on this side of the molecule. And uh, this oxygen is a lot bigger than the hydrogen, yes. Uh, so there's a, a net negative on this side of the molecule. So there's really an unequal distribution of charges. So there's more kind of positive on this side, more negative on that side. That's what polarity is. All it's saying is that it's an unequal distribution of charge. And the charge is coming from our electrons. Oxygen is way bigger than hydrogen is. So the electrons are going to be more around the circling around oxygen, so they're going to be more likely to be found on this side as opposed to hydrogens, where there's only like that one electron that it has, um, than they are over here. So there's going to be more negative over here, and if we don't have electrons, we're more positive, right? So that's where this kind of partial positive charge comes into play. That's polarity. So let before, just real quick before you have questions, now we have nonpolar. So not polar, right? Super difficult. Um, so that means there is an equal distribution of charge. And where we're going to see this is from things such as uh, H2 or O2. So those two are the same molecules. So it's just written out as like, like a, a H bonded to an H or an O bonded to an O. And those are going to be equally shared because it's the same molecule. Right? You can't, um, uh, if it's the same thing, it's, it's got to share it equally. If they were different, like if they were different elements, like in oxygen and hydrogen, you can see how they can share it unequally. 
So anytime you see like an H2 or an O2 or an F2, what have you, you know that's nonpolar because it's going to be shared, those electrons are going to be shared equally in the bond. So polar, all polar is just unequally shared. Electrons, yes, exactly. Good. Any other questions? Um, pretty, pretty much, pretty much. So, um, I mean, you could have something like uh, CH4, where it's, so you have like a C, and you have something like this, a carbon. Sorry, I'm just throwing letters at you. So that's like a carbon surrounded by four hydrogens, and then that would also be nonpolar. Um, but he didn't give you that kind of he didn't give you that kind of example. So I think on the test, if he just gives you like C two H two O two, he won't give you C two because that's not really a, a thing. Um, H two or O two or F two, anything with a little subscript two on it, nonpolar covalent is what I'm trying to get at. Do you think that's the question? Uh, potentially, I don't know which one he's going to ask, but he's for sure is going to ask like this bond is is an example of what. Um, hmm. It's because they're both covalent bonds. They're both sharing the electrons. The way the bond works is that all the, of these are sharing the electrons. So you know how I said that over here on ionic, like this one, the sodium donated the, to the chloride? Right. Well, the way this one works is uh, this has... Hmm, Whereas H2O, oxygen, where is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, right? So there's six in its outer shell, and it needs to get to eight, right? So it needs two more. Hydrogens each have one. So six plus one plus one equals eight. They all share it together is how that works. So it's not like stealing. It's sharing. So they're all sharing the bond. So whether it's nonpolar, whether they're sharing them equally or unequally, it's still a covalent bond. That one, that's the same thing as covalent. Yes. But the sharing. The sharing. Good. All right. Um, coordinate covalent is pretty much when uh, one atom provides all the electrons. So for here, we have an amino group. We'll get to that. Um, it's got all eight electrons here, and we have this hydrogen, that, hydrogen that's positive. If it's positive, has it gained or lost an electron? Lost, right? That's getting you thinking that way. It's lost an electron, um, but it can still come in here and make this bond with this lone pair. Not going to matter. Um, pretty much, just know the definition. Coordinate covalent provides all the electrons when making the bond. I'll try to emphasize the things that I feel like you need, need to be emphasized. Um, I'll answer any questions, but I'll try to emphasize the things that need to be really emphasized. Mm -hmm. um, kind of walk through all the, the little dots in F2. Mm -hmm. um, that, um, so every dot is an electron. Pretty much we're always trying to add up to eight in a molecule. So each dot is one, and that's just, they're kind of in pairs. Each Every bond is two electrons, so there's usually four bonds around like a nitrogen or a carbon or a C. So each dot is an electron. Uh, this is pretty much just saying hydrogen with a positive charge, so it's lost its electron. So whenever you see the positive charge, it's, you've lost an electron. If you see a negative charge around brackets, it's gained an electron. And what's the X? That's just plus. No, the it's yeah, it's this plus that equals that. that. Oh, I think that's just saying it's part of a bond. 
it's not important. Don't worry about it. He's, you're not going to. It's just oh, yeah. pretend it's a circle. It's an, it's an electron that's yeah. participating so, in a bond. So X is supposed to be a dot. I guess so. Do you question? Yeah. Yeah. More shells, more energy. Um, count down the number of rows, one, two, three, four. So each row is a, that's the max. Yeah. So coordinate covalent bond is the one molecule or the one atom is just donating all the electrons. So earlier, how um, in our water example, oxygen donated six because it has six and it's covalent and it's, um, oh my god, what's the word I'm looking for? And it's a valent shell. It has six and it's outside one. Hydrogen had one and one. So instead of like each of them donating a certain amount of electrons to make the bond, this just donates all of them to make the bond. So none come from this and all of them come from that. Did I answer the question? No. Good. Any other questions? Cool. I know it's like a lot of basic stuff. Sorry if I'm not like hitting it. I'm trying. <laughs> but uh, all right. Next we have hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are tricky. Need to know them though, especially when we get to like protein, what have you. So. Um, Hydrogen bonds are when hydrogens, right? Hydrogen, first thing on the periodic table, typically has one electron. Uh, when hydrogens form polar bonds, are electrons shared equally or unequally in polar bonds? Unequally, unequally right? Because nonpolar, there's no polar, um, no polar charge. So when hydrogens atoms form polar bonds, so unequal sharing, with another com entirely completely atom and it takes on a slight positive charge. Um, so pretty much that gives it a slight, po that slight positive charge allows it to be attracted to another slight negative charge, right? Because opposites attract. Uh, and that's what hydrogen bonds are. And that's why water is so awesome, for like lack of a better word. Um, you know, like we can go, it's so liquid and fluid and it sticks with each other when it's in a glass of water, right? Um, that's because of all those hydrogen bonds that are just keeping it, all those molecules sticking together. And there is not a picture of that. Yeah, there is over here. Good. All right. The hardest thing to understand with hydrogen bonds is that it's between two different atoms. So pretend we're going to just further emphasize that because I'm sick of not explaining it very well to where people aren't doing that very well. So we have, uh, uh, I lied, wrong line. So we, uh, uh, we'll leave it. All right. So we have, no, I lied. No, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. <laughs> Bingo, right there. All right. So we have one water here, and we have one water here, and it's this one, like that. Uh, is this water polar or nonpolar covalent? Polar covalent, right? So we have these hydrogens over here but um, that are partially positive because most of the electrons are surrounding this big oxygen that's got six electrons kind of surrounding around it. So more of the electrons are over here, so a little bit more negative. So these are a little bit more positive, right? So we know that this oxygen is slightly negative, slightly. Overall, the whole molecule is neutral. Um, but, so the same thing, the same principle applies here, right? Partial negative around the oxygen here, and this hydrogen has a partial positive, right? So this hydrogen on this atom is gonna make a hydrogen bond with 
this oxygen on this completely separate atom because it's negative and opposites attract. These bonds are super weak by itself. It's really just an attraction. Um, it's really like, a, hmm, I don't know, it's like there's that one person in class who has like this really outgoing personality and you're kind of like, oh, I kind of like want to be around them just because they're kind of nice, but I don't really have to be around them, so I'm going to go hang out with my friends too. It's kind of like that. But if you combine, like if you look at water, for example, like a glass of water, right, everything's kind of sticks together. Um, if you keep adding them, a bunch of them together, they can make a big difference and can be very strong. But individually, it's very weak because it's just kind of like an attraction. It's like, oh, I kind of like want to be over here. Like, I'll get kind of close to you, but if you go that way, I'll go, I'll go this way too. It's not a big deal. Is that helpful? Do I need to say that again? Yes? No? Be vocal? Any answer? Okay. Um, so like water, we kind of just talked about it. It has polarity. It has hydrogen bonding. That's what makes it awesome. Uh, water is a solvent. Uh, so it can dissolve polar co compounds. A solvent is really just, uh, I hate a chemistry lab. So for those of you who are chemistry majors, like, good for y'all. Um, couldn't do it. Um, it's a solvent, so pretty much it's what you pour something into is a solvent. So like when, uh, like you're making an alcoholic beverage, right? Oh, I'm sorry, we don't do that. Um, <laughs> but so like that's, that'd be like, uh, like when you're doing like a, yeah. So yeah. So like when you're when you have like a like the mio, little drop things, whatever. Like your glass of water would be the solvent, or would be the solution. No. Yeah, it would be the solvent. Yeah. And then um, like what you like the little squirt things would be your uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Solute, right? So your solvent would be the water. Your little mio would be your solute. So that's all it is, is the solvent is just what is dissolving something. Water is very good at that because it's polar. And if we say it's dissolving something, so it's basically separating out So what happens is because water has that polarity, it has those partial negatives and partial positives, it's able to kind of like break apart the ionic bonds within things. Uh, so the positives are attracted to the negatives and vice versa, which allows salt to dissolve in water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, this is kind of important. I don't know if he'll ask you this, but he might. Um, hydrophilic. Who, didn't, who can tell me what hydrophilic means? Just say it. Yeah, like water philic is like, likes water um, or attracted to water are soluble in water, so like dissolves like, dislike does not dissolve like, I don't know the other part of that, but like dissolves like. So something that's polar can be dissolved in water. Something that's nonpolar cannot. So an example would be like water and oil, right? I think so whenever we see that on the side of the road, that the oil just sits on top of it because that's a nonpolar substance. Water can't dissolve it. So that's why it stays separate and together, as opposed to being dissolved and mixed together. So hydro, hydrophobic, phobic is like you have a phobia of something, you have a fear of something, um, or insoluble in water. What time are we at? Okay, good. All right, um, this next part, Osmosis, Osmosis Jones. Anybody remember that movie? That's old, right? Was that Will Smith? Was that who was the voice of that? Chris Rock. Okay, I know for sure it wasn't Adam Sandler. Right? <laughs> um, all right, osmosis: uh, the spontaneous movement of the solvent water across a semipermeable membrane into an area of higher solute concentration. Uh, what does that mean? All osmosis is trying to do is saying, I just want to be, um, I just want everything to be equal. So say you have like a membrane, uh, it's kind of hard to describe like at a really basic level, but 
uh, water can pretty much pass, th pass through um, membranes really easily, or semi-permeable membranes really easily. And we have different concentrations of whether it be ions or proteins or what have you on either side of the membrane. So if, uh, say like, on this, okay, we'll use y'all as an example. So say this like whole divider thing is a membrane. And we have equal amounts of water on both sides, but we clearly have more of y'all over here than on this side. Maybe y'all smell, I don't know why, it's not, I'm not gonna judge. So, um, but there's water on both sides. Well, the water wants to have the same kind of like concentration gradient, the same um, like water to person ratio as possible. So what's gonna happen is that water is gonna go from this side to this side, trying to equal out. So instead of taking, um, we'll say that like, uh, we'll like pretend like there's jail bars in between, so like y'all physically can't, like y'all can't go over to this side, so the only thing that can go across is the water, right? And so that's, since that's the only thing that can go across to try to equal it out, the water's gonna go from over here because there's not, there's a really high um, or a low concentration of people to water versus over here where there's a high concentration of people to water. So it's gonna try to equal that out. So water's gonna come to this side and it's like perfect, we got the right whatever water to person ratio there is. Was that terrible? I'm sorry if it was. So that's all osmosis is. It's just the movement of water trying to balance out the concentrations on both sides of the membrane. Um, feel free to use that example with all your friends and at parties. Um, you're gonna get a lot of those from me this trimester, I guarantee it. Um, and so the force, pretty much what's moving the water, like we said, is driven by the differences in osmotic pressure or different um, ratio concentrations on either side of the membrane. Um, and like I said, plasma membranes are more permeable to water than to other solutes such as ions or proteins or fats or what have you just because there are specific channels for water to go through. It's really easy. Water is what, like 75% of our bodies, something ridiculous like that. Someone, okay, someone told me that we were like 50% bacteria is what, like we're mostly bacteria. I didn't check the facts, I just like saying it. But I thought that was kind of cool. I don't know, maybe not. Maybe I'm spreading lies. Uh, osmotic pressure uh, is described as the pressure required to maintain that equilibrium. So once the water gets over here and it's like, all right, we're perfect, perfectly happy, the osmotic pressure is kind of like what keeps it there. Um, osmolarity, the solute concentration, which can exert a specific osmotic pressure on the cellular membrane. I don't think he's gonna ask you about like that definition of osmotic. Will he ask you like that definition? He asked us about uh, solution I think he's gonna ask. Did, didn't he ask us about like the next like hypertonic versus hypotonic? Yeah. I thought he did. Did, you, did, did you do this too? Okay. So osmotic pressure. So I guess circle E is. So I guess I'll write a TQ myself. TQ. Knowing osmosis is definitely important. Osmotic pressure. So if you see anything. Um, maintaining equilibrium across the membrane with no net movement of solvent. Um, that's kind of like the happy medium where everything's at. It's like, hey, I'm good. Osmolarity, the solute concentration, which can exert a specific osmotic pressure on the cellular membrane. So I think this one's kind of coming from like the ions or like you people kind of exerting a certain amount of pressure being there in an isotonic solution. So there's three different types of solutions. We're pretending we're all in water. There's isotonic, um, ice, yeah, and what does iso mean? I heard it. The same, right? Iso means same. Tonic means tone. So it's the same tone, kind of the same pressure on each side. So all that's saying is really, it's uh, the same pressure is being exerted from this side than there is on this side. It's very happy, the cell is like perfect. I don't have to do any work I don't have to move water anywhere to balance out. So the, sh the cell will not shrink or swell. Wow, that was actually difficult to say. Um, then we have hypotonic. Hypo meaning? Less or uh, lower. Um, so this is a solution in which the osmolarity 
outside the cell is lower than in the cytosol. Cytosol is within our cell. It's, um, you'll learn that in cells and tissues. But it's pretty much the water inside the cell. Um, so when the cell is put in a hypotonic solution, the water molecules are going to enter the cell, and the cell is going to swell. So that's this picture right here. You're gonna, he's going to ask a question, what happens in a hypotonic solution? And you're going to need to know swell. Um, and that's just because um, the water concentration is higher than the solute. And so if too much water comes in into the cell, um, it's like a water balloon. If you fill it up too much, it's what? It's going to like break, right? You've got to start all over again. It's no fun. Well, except the cell dies. So it's kind of a little bit more drastic. Um, a hypertonic solution is when the osmolarity outside the cell is higher than the cytosol. So that would be like uh, on this side of the room. So the water, so say we have two different cells here now. Uh, the water is going to go from uh, here over to this way. So y'all are going to swell and potentially burst. They're going to shrink because they're losing water. And yeah, shrink. Y'all don't burst. Y'all can still live, I guess. That's nice. Um, that's what happens when you're on the left side. And that's really all it is. So hypotonic, swell can, cell can swell, potentially burst. Hypertonic can shrink because it's losing water. Water is going out. So yeah. The yeah, there's going to be a lot of typos in the book. Yeah. It just says Perfect. That one should say hypertonic. That took me a lot to get over. It took me until try two to get over that. So don't be like me. Yeah. Um, so, all right. Any questions on that? No? We're just talking about met water movement across the cell membrane. Yeah. For sure that's going to be a test question. So the ionic bond was when uh, one electron uh, or electrons are taken physically from one atom to a different atom, uh, leaving a negative charge uh, on the, OK, so let me start over. Um, one atom is going to donate electrons to another one. The one that donates the electrons is going to be more positive because it loses the electron that's negative. The other one's going to become negative because it's gaining the electron, right? And then that positive and negative charge attract, and that's the bond. The bond between that positive and negative is what is the bond. And that example would be like salt, sodium chloride, or anything that's, you can make pretty much any, anything out of here, like sodium, argon, lithium, or I'm sorry, not sorry, I'm like lithium chloride, sodium fluoride, so lithium bromide. Like what is an example of it? Like you're going to have to think of it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You'd probably say like sodium chloride is an example of what? And you'd say ionic bond. Any other questions? Let's take five minutes. Let's take five minutes.
Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure that I didn't skip coming back over into the isotonic solution. Um, isotonic solutions, the cell is neither going to shrink or swell, right? Iso means the same, tonic meaning tone. So pretty much that's pretending like we have equal number of people on this side and this side. The water is not going to go anywhere because it's the same, right? Um, so in an isotonic solution, the cell is pretty much just going to stay where it's at. Water doesn't need to go anywhere. Just wanted to make sure I came back and said that. All right, moving forward, we're going to try to be quick. We're going to try to be done by 6.30. Um, acids and bases, acids donate electrons. Acids give them away. Um, and then pretty much all your acids are going to be the ones that have acid after it. So that's really nice, right? Um, hydrochloric acid, so that's HCl. Sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Phosphoric acid is H3PO4. Carbonic acid is H2CO3, that's a C, H2CO3. Um, I just want to write that in there just in case, and also my handwriting is terrible. Did yes. Did you say donate electrons? Yes. Because they release protons. Wait, what did I say? Electrons. Definitely meant protons. Sorry. Definitely protons. Y'all are so smart. That was another. That was a mini test, and you passed, right? <laughs> School of Rock, when, you know, when she like asked him, like, I thought you don't believe in that. You pass. Um, right, so acids donate protons. Bases accept protons. That's as basic as it gets. And so I just wrote these here just in case he has it written out like that on the test. He might do that. So if you see HCl, H2SO4, H3, that's a P, PO4, and H2CO3. Um, Just those. Just those. Just those. Well, we need another formula as well or something. Just in case. I, I don't remember that specific on the test, but just in case he does. Um, bases, so they accept protons. Um, and wait, bases are compounds that accept protons or lowers hydrogen levels in a solution or releases like a hydroxyl. Uh, hydroxyl is just an alcohol, pretty much. It's just the OH. It's just an OH. I'll explain the negatives later in a little bit. Um, but pretty much bases, so they either accept hydrogens or they donate OH groups. It's just the opposite. So water is like the ultimate thing because it's awesome. Everything is awesome. So it can either just um, donate a hydrogen or it can donate like the OH group, which is why water can act as like either an acid or a base. Um, that's an aside. But if you see a base, anything that ends like an oxide, so sodium hydroxide, which is going to be NaOH, CaOH2. Don't ask me to explain it because it's not worth your time, to be honest with you. Ammonium. Hydroxide is going to be Na3OH. Um, so I don't think he's going to put like an Na. He's going to, I don't think he's going to put that separate thing on there. But bases, I think this is like a definition one. Like bases accept, whereas protons donate. Um, so ionization of water, like we said, so water can kind of split into hydrogens and uh, hydroxides. Um, Ionization of water is quantified by the ion product of water, K, whatever, and the basis of the pH scale. So pH pretty much is just telling you if something's more acidic or if something's more basic. So it's kind of talking about where the hydro like are there a bunch of hydrogens? Are there kind of a lot of hydrogens floating around? Are there not a lot of hydrogens? There's like way not a lot of hydrogens. Um, so our pH range, right? Um, Strong acids, like in our stomach, right? Our stomach secretes HCl from parietal cells. Um, so our stomach is very acidic, right? So stomach's going to be kind of like down here because it's got to break all that stuff up. It's kind of interesting. Look how acidic uh, co Coke is or soda is, three. It's like barely less acidic than 
your stomach acid. And that's going through your esophagus, um, which is what happens, acid reflux, right, is when that stomach acid comes back up into your esophagus and burns it. So do you think over time, potentially drinking soda, you can you know, cause that damage to your esophagus? Potentially. Yeah, lemon juice, way more specific. So if take that lemon out of your water when you're drinking at the restaurant. No, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, but don't. There's a lot of chemicals on those lemons a lot. Do that research. Check it. Um, anyway, whole different aside. We're trying to finish by 630. Um, human, so below 7, acidic. Above 7, basic. So 7.01 to 14, basic. So uh, 6.99 down to zero, acidic. When you say basic, you mean base? Yes, okay. basic as in base. Um, so that's just right here. And blood, need to know this one. Normal pH of blood in our human is slightly basic. So test question. for sure, test question. So 7.35 to 7.45, need to know that exact range. He's not going to ask you about like any of these other things. Like, like, he's not going to ask you, like, ammonia, household ammonia is a or basic. No, just the blood, and just know that bases are up higher. Uh, the lower the number, the more acidic it is. Buffers. Buffers are pretty much um, what it prevents really large pH changes in your blood from happening. So... We want our blood to stay pH about 3.0 or 7.35 to 7.45, right? That's kind of like the homeostasis, right? We kind of heard that word thrown out before, maybe, um, like the equilibrium of our body. So there's ways that in our body to prevent like huge increases, uh, like saying like getting super acidic or what have you. Um, if you've ever heard of um, like when, uh, oh my God, I can't think of the words right now. Like when people are like breathing too fast, like on an airplane, right? They're like hyperventilating. that hyperventilating. Um, like their pH, like ugh, I'm a terrible example. I can't think of it. It, it prevents like big chain, big slings. So there's different ways. There's a bunch of different. Let's see where are the next, where are the different buffers going down here. We have different ones. We have hemoglobin. If you can't see that, hemoglobin, bicarbonate phosphate and protein need to know those. Those are test questions. Those are different types of buffers. Pretty much these are just ways of saying, hey, um, we don't want big changes because if we get big changes in pH, bad things are going to happen. Proteins are going to denature. We'll get to that. Um, stuff's just not going to work and potentially could lead to like really bad things for our body. So we want to try to prevent big pH changes because we're happy at 7.35, 7.45. We're very happy there. We don't want to really deviate from there. Buffers prevent big changes uh, in pH, um, even if a strong acid or a strong base is added. And we need to know what it's made up of. This is for sure a test question. Yeah? What, what is a buffer? Yeah. So it's a weak acid and it's conjugate base. Or a weak base and conjugate acid. Yeah, and it's going to say it just like that. He's going to ask you what is a buffer, and you just need to know it's a weak base or a weak acid and it's conjugate. And all it's con this, the rest of this is talking about um, this is, is like talking about like the conjugates, pretty much. I, know, I could explain to you, but we have more important things to do. Just know the word conjugate, if that's possible. Ask questions. We need to go to individual. If you see me, just ask me later. Or if you go to different tutoring, just ask them. Um, um, cool. Need to know the Henderson Hasselbalch equation. Um, where is it at? pH equals pKa. Mm, that doesn't look right. Yeah. So this is a TQ. We need to know this equation. Henderson Hasselbalch equation. 
just learn it. It's not worth your time to actually understand what it is, to be honest with you. I didn't say that. Um, yeah, you just got you just got to pick it out. I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, he's going to ask you for sure. Handles didn't have something tag. That's why I just pointed this one because I didn't want to confuse you. Like it's the one above it. Know the buffers. He's probably going to ask you like which of the following is not a buffer system. Maybe. Maybe not. In what context? No. He's not going to ask you to like identify a molecule or anything like that. This is all just like general review, like what these things are, just because it. I don't know. Like it matters in some, but it's really not going to matter in the long run. That's not my box. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, I, I try to do everything in pencil. So if you see anything like in pen, unless I say it, it's typically not mine because this is not my book. I just borrowed it from one of my friends. Um, carbon, it's kind of important. There's a whole like organic chemistry. If you took organic chemistry, it's pretty much just carbon chemistry. It's kind of a big deal. Um, don't worry about it. You took that class, good for you. Um, I took that class. It was, I don't know. I enjoyed, I, I enjoyed OCHEM too, but whatever. Important metal ions, we'll get to it. Don't worry about memorizing that right now. Carbon. All right, this is kind of important. He usually has at least two or three questions, I think, on this next part. Is that about right on all the different functional groups and what have you? Um, this is just going to be making flashcards like, and just drilling them if you've never done it before. Um, or, if, or Quizlet. I don't know if you're more computery, if you like the Quizlet better. It's a free. If you don't know what Quizlet is, it's just like online flashcards. Perfect. So instead of making them all yourself, they're already made. Douglas M. Wright, I'll write it. Douglas, I think it's one S? M. Wright. Actually, really nice guy. Daniel Murray. Daniel Murray? Yeah, he's, pro he's probably got some of them. I know like Alberto Doria, he's in my class. He made a bunch of them too. Uh, but yeah, Douglas probably has the most. So if you just want to look on Quizlet, he's probably got a lot of the classes. That's what he did. For the last school. Anyway, functional groups. These are things that are found uh, on different molecules, and it pretty much um, our body is very specific. We have a lot, like the stomach. Uh, it it needs to be able to have a signal come in and say, "Hey, release stomach acid to digest this food, break it down." Um, then it needs to go. Uh, through the what the pylor pyloric sphincter, and then go into the duodenum, and then something in the duodenum's got to say, "Hey, like it's here now, so we need to digest it further," and it's got to go to like the next part and what have you. So it, there's very specific signaling and communication that goes on with different parts of our body, right? Our brain's going to do something different than our muscles, than our gallbladder, what have you. And these functional groups are kind of the languages that say, "Hey," or the the things that say, "Hey, I'm different." Uh, than this thing because I have this functional group. And so um, by having this, it's going to lead to this. It makes a way bigger difference in like organic chemistry when you're trying to turn, like actually do equations and map stuff out. Um, we're not going to be like doing those kinds of equations in this class. So get excited that you're not have to do that, but it's also kind of sad because it's fun. Um, but anyway. We need to know the different names of them because we just need to know the different names of them. Uh, the first ones are methyl, ethyl, and phenyl. Methyl is talking about um, there's one carbon with three hydrogens around it. So methyl, ethyl is one carbon, ethyl is two carbons. So methyl, I like to think of like methyl, like mono. Mono is one, right? So just one carbon is a methyl. And it's really hard for me to like explain this on just like this like really individual level. They usually spend like a few days on this in organic chemistry trying to like teach you these things. Um, so I'm sorry if this sounds like super bad for my part. Good movie. Um, so ethyl is two carbons. 
Phenyl is just a ring of six carbons. It's a phenyl group. Um, coincidentally, phenyls, for those of you who took chemistry, chemistry lab, those are like our aromatics, right? The ring structure, they smell very good, like our aromas, like flowers are pretty and smell nice. Question? Yeah? Uh, just the versatility of the carbon bond, like does it just in different ways that the carbon bonds and things? Yep, so carbon can bond to hydrogens. It can make double bonds to nitrogens, it can bond to oxygens, can bond to other carbons, can double bond to oxygens, can double bond to other carbons. It's very versatile. That's why there's whole organic chemistry classes pretty much just talking about how carbon bonds to stuff. Okay. And what kind of questions would you ask on that? Nah. Um, nah. He's gonna he's he's gonna ask us like he's gonna put C double bond O H and he's, you're gonna have to name it. So we're going to do flashcards for these, for the functional groups. Yeah. So starting for the final, but no, you won't really need it except for the final in this test, potentially, I don't think. Um, but yeah, so pretty much anything that's bolded, like if you want to make a flashcard, if you need it, just put the name and then the structure on the back. There's going to be at least two questions on the test that are like, what's this functional group? And you have to name it. Charges, not for these specifically, no. All right, carbonyl, um, it's going to be more of an aldehyde uh, versus a, this other carbonyl, which is a ketone. I don't know why it's ketonel, but that's okay. Um, our aldehyde is just C double bond O and an H at the end. Whereas this carbonyl group is just this um, C double bonded to an O, a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. And these R's, for those of you who don't know what R's are, is pretty much just a bunch more carbons that don't matter. Yeah, it's just a chain of carbons that don't matter. So an aldehyde is kind of like the H is kind of like a period. It's the end of the sentence. This is going to be found at the end. Um, whereas a ketone is just going to be like a C double bond O. Um, kind of in the middle of everything, and there's just more carbons on either side. Um, uh, let's see what's next. An ether. I said this is going to be, be repetition for you. I'm sorry, I don't really have. I try to like do some things, but the way I remember ether is with diethyl ether. Uh, it's like really stuck with me when I took OCHEM. Um, but diethyl, so this is an e ether, would be just one of these. These are carbons here. Um, diethyl ether is just two. There's like a, there's just multiple carbons, whatever. Looks like a bat. Draw a little smiley face. Hi, I'm a happy bat or mean bat, dripping blood, whatever. Um, so di ether, how I remember that is just like the O in the middle. Looks like a bat. So if you ever see just like a random O thrown into anything, that's ether and oxygen. It's not a big deal. Um, this should say ester and not ether. That's a typo. Um, but we're going to do uh, carboxylic acid first. Where is that at? Why isn't that anywhere? Um, perfect. We're not. OK, so uh, I guess we'll start. So an ester is just a C double bond O with another O after it. So there's two O's. Two oxygens. Sorry, this is like really hard to explain like structures. Um, uh, so like and then uh, so that's an ester, e s t e r. We have a carboxylic acid, so we're gonna pretend like there's an H right here, an acid, right? So a carboxylic acid is gonna be C O O H. If you take off that hydrogen, uh, you remove that. Um, positive that um, that positive charge associated with it, and you left with COO negative. That's your carboxylate. Anytime you see ATE, you know that it's just OO. Sorry, it's like it's, I'm. Uh oh, you're late. I like it. Um, your hydroxyls are your alcohols, the things that 
we're going to tell our patients not to drink. Um, so anytime you see just OH is your alcohol. Uh, that should be the easiest one. Um, your acetyl, your enol, like just make a flashcard and learn it. I'm, I, don't, I don't know. Double bond, that shouldn't be a double bond to an H. He, that's, that's wrong. Like I said, just, I don't really have good, good study strategies, but all I can say is know these. I'll test y'all on them next week if you decide to study them. And if not, that can be your study, study time too. But I know that he emphasizes these on the exam. You need to know them. Um, you just change the, the C to the H to a single? Yeah, it should just be a single. Don't ask why he's not, it's not worth your time. Yeah. <laughs> and then your enol, what have you. Uh, the green and these blue and the pink ones too. You might have to identify one out of a long pink width, but he'll he'll point to it. Anything he'll point to, or he'll make it pretty simple to find out. He's not going to put like this whole chain and then like not label anything. Okay. So he'll point to it. Um, our amino, we need to know these versus amido. How I remember this one, amino does not. There is no oxygen on it. Amido does have an oxygen on it. Um, Sulf, hydryl, sulf, S is sulfur. The S tells you it's sulfur in it. Hydryl just means hydrogen. So a sulfur and a hydrogen. A sulfur and a hydrogen. Yeah, so disulfide, di meaning two sulfurs. There's two sulfurs. It can be that easy sometimes. Just Paying attention to it. Um, a thioester is pretty much like a regular ester that we set up here, C O O R. But thio pretty much is just another word for sulfur. I don't know why it's thio, but you just replace one of the O's with an S. And you have your thioester. Oh, I'm so sorry, this is not more fun. Um, but, but. I'm good looking, right? So that makes it better. No, I'm, that's that's terrible. Um, no. Y'all are good looking, so it makes me makes me okay with it. I can stay here all day. Phos phosphoral. How I remember phosphoral is it has uh, a different oxygen pretty much all the way around it. This oxygen has a negative. This oxygen has a hydrogen on it. This oxygen has a double bond. This oxygen is attached to an R group later on. So there's kind of like a different oxygen all the way around it. Um, so if you forget, just come up with something different. Uh, and this phospho anhydride, anhydride uh, without a water. So pretty much they removed, they put two of these together and removed the water out of it, making the bond. We'll get to that eventually. But um, if you ever see like the two phosphates, phos and they're connected by an O. Yeah. And then the R's just keep going. Pretty simple. And then this is kind of just like a test. So like we have a thioester, right? Regular ester would have an O right there. So C O S thioester, double bond O S. Your amido does have that oxygen on it, right? So a C double bonded to an O does have oxygen. Amido group, another amido group does have the oxygen. This is a hydroxyl, just the O H, right? We're gonna go drink that after this because this is so awesome. Um, phospho anhydride, phospho, you know there's going to be a phosphate in it, so you're looking for a P somewhere. Um, and anhydride, just know that there's going to be two of them connected by that oxygen. Phosphoryl group, it's just an oxygen that's got one of everything. Um, by itself, there's only one phosphate, not two. Your imidazole, don't worry about that. That's, I don't, whatever, don't worry about it. Those are basically all the functions of this right there. Yeah, so this is just like an example of what is this molecule. That's, Acetyl-CoA, we'll learn about that later, uh, pretty important. But it's just showing you how there's a bunch of these different functional groups within it. 
and those function function or structure determines function, and we'll learn that in a lot of our things. So if some like a, a square peg isn't going to go in a round hole, right? Structure determines function. Our body is designed beautifully by innate, an innate intelligence that tells it what to do and how to function, and this is what we are. And um, this is kind of just the very microscopic look of this molecule is made up this way and it has a specific function. Welcome to Biochem Tutoring. It's going to be awesome. Please stick it out with me. I promise it's going to be worth it. I promise you it's going to be worth it. Um, it can be fun. I'll make it fun. I, keep, I need to bring candy. Can one of y'all remind me to bring candy next time? And I'll throw it at you. And then <laughs> if you get a question right, and then if you want to catch it, that's fine. Or if you want to like duck out of the way, hit the person behind you, that's fine too. Um, I'm Andrew Ostrike. Uh, my email, if you want it, is AO, my name is difficult, E I C H at Parker. If you have any email, if you have any questions, please email me, find me, pull me aside. I'll talk to you. It'll be fun. That's the at sign, yeah. So handwriting is really good. I I went I have done calligraphy before, but that business did not succeed. Oh, sorry. A O E S T R E I C H. It's very German. It's not Smith. I'm sorry. Thank you all for being here. Y'all are wonderful. He's, yeah, if y'all see me, introduce yourself. I'm, only Wednesdays, right? Only Wednesdays. I, I, large group here is going to be Wednesdays. Thank you.